what exactly are you? I mean, you're a person, obviously. Or, I don't know, maybe not obviously. Maybe you're an alien or a demon or a sentient dog. Why don't we discuss this down in the comments? Are you a person? It's a humbling thing to realize that you, as a singular being, don't really exist. Because your body isn't a single thing. It's made up of multiple things. Skin, bones, muscle, organs. And those multiple things are made up of even smaller multiple things. Ultimately, all of us are just collections of billions and billions of cells. Different types of cells that do different types of things, but they are all created, they divide, they create other cells, they perform their functions, and eventually they die. And just like us, they want to avoid dying as long as possible. Your cells have no loyalty to you. They don't even know that you exist. They're just doing what they've got to do to survive as long as possible. And it just so happens that what they have to do to survive also happens to keep you alive. Most of the time. In the past, we used to kind of differentiate multicellular life like us from unicellular life like bacteria. You know, there were us cells and there were bacterial cells, which were single-celled organisms that would invade our bodies and cause sickness and disease. But over the years, that's changed. Now we know that bacterial cells serve as an important function in the workings of our body as our us cells do. In fact, our bodies have more bacterial cells than it has us cells. And most amazingly, these bacteria may even dictate our emotions and our cognition. This bacteria has some partial control over our brains. So again, what exactly are you? Well, antibiotics are great. They have extended our life expectancy by two decades and have helped promote huge advancements in organ transplants, disease prevention, and even cancer. But with every positive afforded by antibiotics, there are also negatives, namely drug resistance. Because as humans, when we see something that we think is good for us, we like to do it to the upper level that we could possibly do it. We overdo everything, including antibiotics and hand sanitizer. Unfortunately, bacteria is adaptable, and it'll set out to resist anything that wants to kill it. In fact, it took less than 10 years after the first penicillin trials before we started to see some antibiotic resistance from Staphylococcus aureolus in the 1940s. Usually though, we can keep up with this trend. The bacteria adapts, we find new drugs. The bacteria adapts again, we find newer drugs again. It's an ongoing thing. It's like a game of tennis between the Williams sisters. Each one of them adapts to the other one's playing style, they react accordingly, and each one of them are really determined to win. The big question is, are we Serena or are we Venus? Never thought the Williams sisters would give me an existential crisis. But as I said in the intro, we're starting to learn that bacteria are not all our enemy. In fact, some of them are very beneficial to us. There are between 300 and 500 different species of bacteria living in your gut right now. And when you combine that with different fungi and viruses, you get what they call a microbiota or microbiome. And every person's microbiome is unique because you get it from your mother as well as your own diet and lifestyle choices. And while bacteria exist all over your body, it's the ones in your gut that have the biggest effect on your life. Everything from metabolism to digestion to mood. And some of the diseases it may treat or prevent include rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, and heart disease. And, as I teased earlier, depression. A recent study by European scientists showed that there may be a connection between the gut and the brain, especially when it comes to depression. Dr. Sarah Vieira Silver and Dr. Joran Reyes from the Catholic University in Leuven in Belgium led the study. In it, they and their colleagues analyzed the fecal microbiota of 1,054 Belgians enrolled in the Flemish Gut Flora Project to see how the microbiome correlates with host quality of life and depression. According to their paper published in Nature Microbiology, they found that butyrate-producing Faecalobacterium and Coprococcus bacteria were consistently associated with higher quality of life indicators. However, Dialister and Coprococcus were depleted in people with depression, even after allowing for factors such as age, sex, and antidepressant use, which can all affect the gut microbiome. And a similar microbial community was found in people with Crohn's disease. According to Reyes, apparently microbial communities that can be linked to intestinal inflammation and reduced well-being share a set of common features. And they compared the results with another study that had 1,063 people and found similar results. So this got Reyes and his team looking for different ways of figuring out how these gut microbiomes can actually affect mood. And they found a list of 56 different substances that are created in the gut microbiome that are essential for nervous system function. For example, there's a link between dopamine production and depression in that bacteria Coprococcus that I mentioned a minute ago. It actually has a pathway related to that. It also makes butyrate, which I mentioned earlier, and that's an anti-inflammatory substance. And increased inflammation is often tied to depression. This is correlation, not causation, of course, but there is clearly an observed link. Now, in an interview with phys.org, Dr. Imran Mayer was 
Quick to point out that this doesn't necessarily mean that a microbe causes depression. It's the chicken and egg question, Mayer said. People with depression certainly have different diets and different habits than people without depression, and that would affect the gut microbiome. So Mayer thinks there may be like a circular thing going on, like the gut microbiome helps sort of instigate depression, and then the depression causes different types of dietary habits to form, and then those kind of exacerbate the gut microbiome, and so on and so on. So more research is needed before we can fully blame depression on bacteria. Now this kind of brings up a very obvious question, which is, could taking probiotics actually help with depression? You know, a lot of people are taking probiotics through yogurt or supplements or whatever. It's a growing market all around the world. A lot of people have had a lot of benefits from taking probiotics in various ways. Could depression be one of them? A 2017 study in the Annals of General Psychiatry tried to answer this question and, uh, well, they couldn't. For this study, they looked at 10 different studies that had between 24 and 142 participants in it, all of them double-blind and placebo-controlled and all that, to try to assess the effect of probiotics on mood. And they said, quote, The majority of the studies found positive results on all measures of depressive symptoms. However, the strain of probiotic, the dosing, and the duration of treatment varied widely. In other words, the findings were mixed. Now, another option that's being explored is called fecal microbiota transplants, or FMT. And these are being used to treat conditions such as C. diff, irritable bowel syndrome, and inflammatory bowel disease. And a new study is underway to see if these kinds of FMTs will actually work on depression as well. Neuroscientist Andre Schmidt from the University of Basel is leading the research, which will involve 40 participants who suffer from moderate to severe depression. And these participants are going to take capsules filled with frozen uh, fecal microbiota transplant material, good gut flora. Uh, they're lovingly known as crapsules. And then they're going to evaluate their mental health and see if it makes a difference. This study is set to conclude in November of 2021. Another interesting development in fecal transplant research is the American Gastroenterological Society's Fecal Microbiota Transplantation National Registry. Fit all that on a business card. Being called the largest FMT study in history, it's going to follow 4,000 people who have had an FMT procedure and follow its effectiveness over 10 years, including both physical and mental conditions. So maybe in the future, while therapists are examining your head, they might also examine the other end. But I'd love to hear from you guys. Have any of you had an FMT procedure? Would you be willing to take some crap soles to kind of alleviate some of your depression? Would swallowing crap make you even more depressed? Talk about it in the comments. All right, thanks a lot for watching. Um, we got t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Mugs, posters, it's not just t-shirts, by the way. I need to change it to store, but there's all kinds of fun stuff there, nerdy fun stuff. You can go check that out. Also, if this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for watching. You can check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that as well. Or any of the others on the side over here, if they catch your fancy and you want to check them out, please do. And if you like them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Thursday and every Monday. Mostly Mondays. Usually Thursdays. All right, I'll leave you with that. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.